So uh, we'll start off. So I'm Mike Franklin. I am uh, the, the uh, CDAC faculty director uh, and chair of computer science. I think I know just about everybody. Um, and so uh, welcome to uh, the first uh, uh, talk of the uh, CDAC, of any CDAC uh, speaker series. And uh, it's something we'll be doing uh, this, this uh, season, and uh, we're going to have another one in the fall and so on. So, uh, so uh, glad to see you all here. Um, I was asked to say a little bit about CDAC, uh, and so I'll do that pretty quickly, and then uh, we'll get to the matter at hand. So. Um, so uh, just briefly, so uh, CDAC stands for the Center for Data and Computing, and um, it's uh, it's uh, a new uh, hub. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. This is too small. I can't read it. Uh, so I'll just make it up. So um, so you know, CDAC is 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 uh, was created to facilitate uh, uh, kind of cross campus dialogue and and interaction and research. Uh, uh, in uh, data science and computer science, uh, more specifically uh, in, in conjunction with all the other great things that go on at the university. So uh, the ex explicit purpose of CDAC is to be an, an incubator for new research topics uh, that are cross-disciplinary. And so um, um, CDAC has uh, a bunch of things that it, uh, it does. Um, so in terms of incubation, uh, a big part of what we do is we have a seed grant program uh, that we just ran the first version of uh, about, uh, uh, we announced the winners about a month ago. We funded 11 projects across campus, uh, everything from uh, projects that are automatically transcribing uh, police radio communications uh, to help with public safety. Uh, to uh, immunology uh, programs for, uh, you know, using artificial intelligence to create new molecules, uh, to, um, I'm just going off the top of my head here, uh, a, uh, a group that's building a smart assistants for uh, uh, medical workers in, in developing countries, and so on. And the idea behind the, that program is that anyone on campus can apply um, the only rules are that uh, the, the, the research team has to involve people from multiple departments, and there has to be some uh, scientific goal, so you're advancing some science or, or, or some field, and you're also looking at the underlying uh, data and computing technology that's going to help you with that advance. And so, so it can't just be, I'm going to use some existing machine learning algorithms for some problem that I want to work on in my area, but there has to be some play between uh, the, the science problems you're solving and, and the techniques that you're developing to solve those problems. Uh, and so we got, uh, I think, over, f I think we got like 40 applications from really just about everywhere on campus. The only unit that didn't apply was the Divinity School, and we're working on them so that they apply for the next ones. Uh, um, so we do things like this, like the speaker series, and we host workshops on specific topics. And if you have a workshop that you'd like to host, uh, you should talk to me or is Julia? Okay. Uh, uh, Julia Lane is the executive director. You talk to Julia. Um, and then we're doing a lot of work on outreach just sort of around the city of Chicago and more broadly uh, bringing in uh, industrial partners and, and people at uh, national labs and, and things like that. Um, so that's what CDAC is and, and that's what we're here for. Um, and just as, uh, um, uh, since I have you all here, uh, as I mentioned, this is the first, uh, this is the first talk in our speaker series uh, for, the, for the spring. Um, and we've got uh, some great talks uh, lined up. Uh, this, this time we're doing a mixture of local people and, and some uh, distinguished visitors from outside. And, uh, you, you can see we have uh, people from public policy, uh, ecology and evolution, uh, uh, the Booth School for uh, you know uh, business and economic stuff, uh, and uh, also Tammy Warnow, uh, who's a founder professor at UIUC, is going to talk about uh, her work in computational biology. So uh, we've got a great series lined up here. We're already inviting people for the fall. Uh, so. Uh, um, 
you know, keep an eye on this. We'll have posters around, but we hope to see you at, the, at future talks. So with that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. So, uh, uh, so uh, Mike Caffarella is, a, is an associate professor of computer science at Michigan. Uh, he's a database person by training, which is why we like him. Uh, but uh, he's done all sorts of really interesting work uh, uh, at the intersection of uh, databases and economics, databases and uh, you know, various human systems. He's even done some AI stuff. Uh, he's, um, he should be most famous for being one of the two people who developed uh, initially the Hadoop system. Uh, uh, he also is a founder of a company that was recently acquired. and. Uh, He's just an all-around great guy. So uh, with all that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Mike Caffarella. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to talk to you today. So uh, the topic of my talk today is going to be building data-intensive systems for the social sciences. Let's take a look for a moment about how uh, some example social scientists using kind of a, a traditional uh, data infrastructure might answer some questions. So let's consider an economist uh, who wants to try to estimate Hurricane Sandy. You may remember Hurricane Sandy hit New York City a number of years ago um, and had was the, the weather event, sort of the, the largest economic impact, uh, I believe, in history. Um, estimate its impact on unemployment at different uh, regions of the country, in particular all throughout the New York area. So. Imagine that someone wants to actually estimate this. Well, if you're using kind of traditional data sets, um, which are often collected by the government, often survey-driven, she might start by asking if there are any existing surveys for businesses in the hurricane-hit area. Um, maybe in this case, let's imagine there aren't any. Um, those surveys don't happen to exist. But there is going to be a monthly unemployment survey from the government. Um, unfortunately, you know, that month hasn't elapsed yet. Uh, so she has to wait for some period of time before that survey can be conducted, for it to be processed and released before she can actually do her work. After finally you know, waiting for that survey that's not exactly what she wanted and waiting some period of time for it to come out, the, she can then finally start doing some amount of statistical examination and manipulation, finds that after building the model, um, the hurricane is causing a spike in local employment in the New York area and then wants to explore which sub-regions of the New York area are most interesting. She wants to, in particular, explore Staten Island, finds the data doesn't have the resolution to actually support that analysis, and has reached yet another, perhaps, dead end uh, in answering these questions. Um, mainly because in the survey that was not perfect in the first place and she had to wait a month for, there simply aren't enough samples in the geographic area that she wants to explore. Now let's examine, or at least consider, sort of an, an alternate reality in which maybe she could live. So she ran into these handful of problems. The data collection wasn't broad enough to support her initial work, had to wait around for a pretty slow, traditional survey-driven process, and had to face you know, these bad sample sizes. And yet, if you look at the kind of information that we have on the web or that are collected through modern computational methods, almost all of these problems are addressed, meaning we collect maybe to our regret, data on a huge range of phenomena, not simply a, a small set of pre-selected ones. That data is often collected you know, at extremely high frequency and available at extremely high frequency. And the problem of small sample sizes is, is, is much reduced. It doesn't go away, but the data set is so large that there are now subsets that can be explored um, that never could have been explored before, simply because the data collection is so cheap and prevalent it's much easier for us to get fine granularity data, for example, unemployment data on Staten Island. However, all of these three you know, supposed advantages of the new data intensive era come with their own issues, meaning if you have a huge range of phenomena, it can now be pretty difficult for you to choose features for your model. Like what, do you, how, what kind of insight do you actually have uh, when you have to understand every possible phenomenon out there? Um, you might have a ton of data. It's being constantly updated, and you have a huge river of it, but of course, your ability to overfit or to find spurious correlations is now correspondingly increased. And your massive data sets also have yet led to massive query overhead. I mean, simply the, the cost of running these queries is many times larger than it was before. And so even though this sort of 
big data or data intensive era of social science uh, analysis has a lot of promise, it's hardly something that we can exploit out of the box. So one of the kind of meta points of this talk is going to be that as exciting as the data intensive social sciences are, um, and they offer a huge uh, op opportunities in many ways, contributing to them meaningfully really, in my view, means not only doing the social science analysis, but doing computer science at the same time. It's very unusual that we can simply grab a brand new, one of these brand new, very different data sets and have it work properly using the traditional tools that social scientists have used to date. Um, I'll say as a general matter, you know, uh, I'll be talking about data management and its application to social science today, but this is a, a small, or you know, just one element of what my group uh, at Michigan does. Um, includes certainly social science, data intensive social sciences, and I'll be talking today about not only an application of now casting data to economics, but data centric tools that we've built for fighting human trafficking. We also have ongoing work uh, more generally on examining the entire data production pipeline that goes into modern price indexes. Price indexes are kind of time varying uh, <clears throat> data sets about price histories that are a crucial ingredient in figuring out cost of living adjustments and in turn figuring out things like GDP growth. Uh, in addition, in a more traditional kind of computer science context, uh, my group does a lot of work in information extraction and data integration, as well as more traditional data systems infrastructure. But let's cut to the real chase today, which is social science. In particular, I'm going to start with trying to use, apply social media to a host of different economic questions. Okay. Now, you may remember the Google Flu Trends project from a few years ago. Uh, this was an effort to use what people were saying on Google to try to predict you know, what the, the flu would look like that season. So if people said, I have a cold or I'm feeling sickly, then maybe that was evidence that the flu would be worse that year. Uh, this, was, this general family of work, which was used not just for flu prediction, but things like mortgage refinancings, uh, a whole host of social phenomena, um, it was called now casting. You don't hear about it so much anymore. Um, it had a ton of promise, which is answering questions that are burdensome for us to collect data on with extremely fast turnaround times. It seems like it would be ready-made for widespread application in the social sciences, but outside of a handful of, of papers, uh, you never really heard about it much anymore. So it's worth investigating, like, why was that? The promise seems so big, and yet the payoff seems not to have materialized substantially. Well. One reason is that the results were often brittle. You would often see these predictive models, like what's next year's flu going to look like, uh, fail in unexpected ways, like the accuracy would suddenly drop. Uh, and also, every additional topic, whether it's flu or mortgage refinancings and so on, would require a pretty substantial effort from data scientists and computer scientists. I mean, it was not a tool that a lone practitioner could download and perform analysis with, but rather was a major academic effort. So a few years ago, some colleagues, uh, both in computer science as well as economists uh, at Michigan, Matthew Shapiro and Maggie Levenstein, we began a multi-year project to try to make now casting safe for economics, meaning if you were a good but not computationally trained economist, um, say either working in academia or maybe working for the federal statistical community, could you somehow make now I'm now casting product that would help them with their lives? And I, I should say, you know, the, uh, I'll talk a lot in this portion of the talk about the federal statistical community, which is to say the set of economists who collect and analyze data for making economic policy making decisions. Um, it's not often talked about, but you know, that community, which comprises the Census Bureau, Department of the Treasury, the Fed, and so on, um, they spend an awful lot of money every year collecting quite a lot of statistics about the economy, something under a billion dollars. And then they spend another, say, $100, $150 million analyzing that data, all to drive a multi-trillion dollar economy. So as data science outfits go, they're pretty good, uh, pretty important. And if we can identify problems in their workflow that computational approaches can help with, it should yield really big dividends for society overall. Anyway, this project uh, is powered substantially by a sample of the Twitter stream. We have about 10% of the tweets going from 2011 to 2016. Uh, that it amounts to about 50 billion tweets and a somewhat smaller sample size since 2016. 
Our first target for this work, which I'll begin in the economics domain and then move to computer science, is something called initial unemployment insurance claims. This is related to but not identical to the unemployment rate that you hear about every month. This number is an administrative number. It's not generated by statistical manipulation or analysis. Rather, it's simply how many people showed up that month, or that rather that week, to make a first-time claim on their unemployment insurance. Um, if we, that is simply a side effect of the way that states operate their unemployment insurance programs. So it has the advantage of coming out weekly instead of monthly, and also the advantage that there are not other hidden inputs into the data. So for example, there's no adjustment for population. It's simply a raw count that comes out every week. So if we could predict this, then it would be a good test case for some of these so social media-driven approaches. Okay. All right, so how can we kind of conceptualize this problem? Well, imagine I have a blue cloud that I'll call social media. That is just to say a huge amount of text messages or posts, whatever you want to call them, that in this case were generated by Twitter, but there's nothing Twitter-specific about this. And then I'm going to have some transformation function in which I take all of those Twitter messages and I yield a set of topics. In our case, I'm going to just enumerate all the sequences of four or fewer words in the data set. Okay, so I need a job. That's one sequence of four or fewer words. And I can say on a certain, by examining that database of, of Twitter messages, on a certain date, I saw that phrase 491 times. On a different date, I saw the phrase Justin Bieber, you know, a correspondingly larger number of times. Okay? And most, many or most of these strings are going to be nonsense. Right? There will also be some topics that are of interest that will not be captured by this, because we're limiting ourselves at four or fewer words. But as a crude first step, this will capture a lot of you know, topics of interest for us. Okay. If we had this, if we had this enumeration of many tens of millions of topics, and for each of those topics, a daily count, which is to say a date along with the frequency of observation, how many unique messages contain that, then for each topic, we can construct a time-varying signal. That is, on the left-hand side, starting at the beginning of our Twitter sample in 2011, at the right-hand side, going to the current day, and every data point there says, on a particular day, how often was unemployment or Justin Bieber or I love you observed in the data set. Okay. So after this processing, we take that large set of text messages and we are basically given you know, several hundred million of these time-varying signals, each with a string annotation describing what it's about. How can you turn that into a prediction uh, mechanism? Well. This is a pipeline that's purely developed on the economic side. This is not computational yet. We'll select a subset of those strings on some topic of interest, say job loss. So I lost a job, I got fired, um, I got a pink slip. That would actually be a phrase that would not be accepted in the four or fewer phrase, but you, you get the idea. After we take a number of those, we'll set it through a, a PCA process to identify you know, the primary factors that were identified in all those time series signals. Each of those factors we'll use as an input to a regression task in which the training set is the official government data. Okay? So we're building a predictive model in which we assume past government data is available to us. And that will give us a, a prediction based on recent social media messages of what next week's number is going to be. Okay? So every week we're going to run it. We're going to tell you what next week's unemployment insurance number is going to be. Um, yeah, so that we take the PCA of the aggregated signals, build that regression model. And what that yields is not just a now casting estimate over time, but an enumeration of all the topics that are relevant to us. So if we had an overfitting, or if, if this model were to overfit in some way, like we were able to come up with a signal that matched the official government data perfectly, but the strings were nonsense, we would be able to see that by looking at these strings. So one of our hypotheses, or, or I should say assumptions, is that if we're going to build a data product that's actually useful to practicing economists, they're going to want to see both of these things. They're going to have evidence that the signal is good, that it, that, that signal fits some pre-held conceptions, like, for example, unemployment should spike right after Christmas when seasonal workers are laid off, but also the topics that are used should make sense. Right? So going back and forth from our economist colleagues for a long time, we're able to produce sort of a, a set of a family of different signals, you know, whether you're axed or canned or downsized and so on, we can say how often we see that. Oh, 
Excuse me. OK, so we're able to build a, a model that has the, the following results. On the left-hand side, it goes from the midsummer of 2011 here to the beginning of 2016 when that large sample uh, became unavailable to us. The blue line here is the official government data, and the red line is our prediction of it you know, one week ahead of time. So a few points where we are, are not, flawed, not flawless, but overall pretty good. Um, just as an artifact, for many years we produce a, a weekly website where we publish this data. And you know, I'm not going to pretend like this was Facebook, right? This is an extremely low audience website. Um, however, if you're going to have 20 visitors a week, we got the right 20 visitors, which is to say, you know, based on like, statistics that we saw of page accesses, we had a very elite crew. So you know, visited by banks, the Fed, and then on one terrific morning, like a Monday that made my like made me very happy in my early career as a professor. Um, I got in the morning, it was like uh, you know, 9, 9.30. A phone call comes in at my desk. The, the from number is Credit Suisse. And some unnamed person says, hey, Mike, when's the uh, data going to be back up? <laughs> and, and I said, well, honestly, like my student Dolan will be in probably in about an hour, and then he'll fix it. I, I realized the pipeline broke last night. He said, oh, OK, thanks. Um, <laughs> I don't know who that guy is, but I've been eating out on his story for, for years now, so I really appreciate it. Um, and you know, this got, uh, excuse me, this got uh, press coverage in all the kind of relevant journals and so on. So nothing here is really computer science yet, right? This is a great engineering effort, maybe of relevance to some economists. Um, but what could you say about it? On the social science side, it's interesting. So a, a, compete, a competing number to this is something that Bloomberg puts together every week. They convene a panel of economists, and they ask them what's next week's number going to look like. So we have a benchmark to compete against. Um, our error is only slightly worse than those economists. And if you look at the surprise of those economists, meaning what they predicted and the true number, if all that our model is doing is capturing those economists' sentiments, like for example, what if they all had Twitter accounts and they posted their, their predictions online and we were reading them in order to make our prediction? If we had no additional information gain beyond those economists, then their errors should appear random to us. We can predict about 15% of their errors, okay? So, which is to say the best model combines both the human insight and our insight, but we're actually tapping into something real. Um, now, it turns out they're not all, this data set is not actually useful to you very much. Like, uh, the unemployment rate, as a general matter, does not change so quickly that you need to predict it a few days ahead of the federal government. Um, now, as a proof of concept, it's very useful because it might tell you what's good and bad about uh, this kind of social media process, but it's not actually super useful on its own. What it is useful for is analyzing this kind of the internal workings of the economy a little bit uh, more strongly, which is to say, by looking at which signals spike and fall, you can tell the government shutdown in 2013 had a seriously negative impact on the economy, but it recovered extremely rapidly after that shutdown ended. Um, if you look at why unemployment spiked in late 2012, you could have two competing hypotheses. It was either the hurricane or it was all the Mitt Romney workers getting laid off. Um, I, I, I said that in a tone of voice that suggests it's, it's a little bit glib, but actually there's no easy way of telling that um, unless you look at this data and you can actually figure out, you know, it's localized in a certain way. It is the hurricane and not the election that caused it. Um, and moreover, the unemployment spike from Sandy was actually very long-lasting, unlike um, the shutdown. Okay. Um, one interesting thing here also is that if you, the accuracy of the model is in some ways less useful than the internals of it which is if you look at those changing factor weights over time, meaning like what's getting more important? Is it job loss or is it job discovery? Well, one thing I didn't go over here is that our model worked really well until 2014 when, like many other now casting models, our accuracy fell off substantially. And the reason that after we explored it for a little while was that basically job loss was no longer a death sentence for unemployment. The economy had recovered substantially enough that if you lost your job, maybe you just go get a new one. And our model was assuming very strongly that job loss amounted to real unemployment. Um, 
that's a, the accuracy of your model is kind of less important than that interesting discovery that the economy is recovering like to re-employ workers who had lost their jobs. Okay. So now let's turn to the more com computing side of things. I don't know why PowerPoint's not rendering my... Okay, here we go. So let's take some of those lessons from that, social, that, that economist social science experience and now try to apply a little computer science to it. So let's go back to our, um, our economist who has at least achieved an amount of enlightenment that she's not going to use traditional data sets. She's going to now use um, a now-casting system. Well, this is really strange. Um, it might go something like this. So we're going to divide that task into a few problems. One is selecting a set of tweets to look at, aggregating them. We're going to keep the same aggregation model as before, which is to say we'll run it through PCA, build the regression model, et cetera. And then we'll evaluate what comes out. And at evaluation time, I'm going to check is the fit of the predicted curve close to real life? Does it have certain features like spikes at the end of the year after seasonal employment that I'm willing to accept? And are the topics you know, close enough to my, to my beliefs that I'll accept it? Now, it may sound like I'm catering too much to the analyst in this case. In a computer science point of view, we are accustomed to, hey, if the machine learning model gets good results, let's go with it. That's, that's extremely not the vibe in, econom in economics in which inspection of the model internals is really key to your professional success as well as making decisions in life. Um, for a long time, I was very skeptical of that, but it occurred to me over time, you, if you're in a world where you're called upon to make extremely infrequent policy interventions and you have almost no data, then a lot of your life should be looking at those models inter model internals. You have to have high priors or strong priors in order to like, be productive in that world. We are in some ways catering to that kind of cultural assumption of economics that I'm going to want to inspect the output, not simply run it through a statistical test in order to have trustworthiness about it. Okay. So after running this, she might ask, do these make any sense? Probably not. Um, is the ground truth correlation good enough? Again, maybe not. Um, if the topics aren't relevant, she'll now add a brand new string to the, the, the set of tweets that she's chosen. We'll rerun it. This process will go on for a very long time uh, where we'll propose some kind of candidate string, run it through the pipeline, see if it's successful, and usually it isn't. Now, it may seem really easy, hey, why don't I just look for the string fired? Well, you know, Russia fired missiles on a competing country, and all of a sudden your predicting, prediction algorithm stopped working. Um, my economist friends love the idea of searching for unemployment benefits um, because people search for benefits when they lose their job. Then the movie Friends with Benefits comes out, and the model goes crazy for a weekend. Uh, the, the point is, the number of failure modes that you run into in trying to choose those subset of tweets, they're enormous and hard to predict. It was really burdensome uh, early on to build this model by hand. So we'd like to avoid doing that. So if we think about the ideal now casting workflow, what we'll call declarative now, now casting, we want to find these relevant features without much iteration. I don't want to be there constantly saying, hey, try, try benefits, try fired, et cetera. The system really should be able to do that for me. And then also, I want interactive time results. So I don't want to be processing you know, the terabytes of data while I sit back and wait for the results. I should be able to get things pretty rapidly. OK. So I'm going to redefine the task very slightly. In the selection phase, enhanced selection now, there's going to be a new interface which we'll call a two-part or two-handed declarative query, which is I say up front what my priors on accepting the result are. So I will, if I, as far as signal fit goes, if I have historical data, then I can provide that here, and you know, I'll measure goodness by some kind of correlation with historical data. On the flip side, if I don't have any historical data but I have strong signal priors like I want seasonal unemployment to spike at the end of the summer at the, at the end of um, the Christmas season, then I can just provide limited data in, in the time domain, excuse me, um, like spikes in the time domain to indicate that. Also, I'll indicate the topic that I'm interested in. At the same time, I'm going to have fast processing. So there's some query optimization work here to be done to make sure the data system gets us good results. Now, on the evaluation side, 
This exists in our artifact and our published work, but I'm not going to talk about it today. We have both user interface tools for you to like poke around and use this tool as if it were a search engine with very fast interactive results, as well as a quality alarm that will tell you you've given me some sets of constraints that seem mutually incompatible, meaning maybe there is no good evidence in the database of all those social media messages that can fit your set of topics with your set of signal domain requirements. Okay. But in the general case, uh, that will work, and hopefully after indicating those up front, the system can answer it. We get through with fast operation and few iterations. So let's see what this looks like. The user model is going to be something like this, where I provide that two-handed query that you see just to the right of our economist. One element here is going to be unemployment-related keywords. Now, these are not strings that I have to fit exactly, just rough topic ideas. Okay, so unemployment or jobs or something like that. In this case, I'm also going to provide historical unemployment. But again, if that is not available, I can provide sort of synthetic data if I were to so choose. I'm going to send those requirements to Raccoon DB. This is named after, of course, the creature that rifles through your trash to find one tiny nugget that's valuable. If you've spent a lot of time on Twitter, then you'll know that feeling. Um, after Raccoon DB is, and Raccoon DB is going to take your query as well as all that top, those topics in order to come up with this query result that I'll show to the user, and hopefully it's going to be accepted the first time around. OK. Let's focus just on this part, picking the queries out of the topic database. Okay? And for the moment, this is going to be primarily a query optimization task. But let's first say what the definition of correctness is. So in this case, you could have sort of a, an, a, an automated way of scoring answers. That is to say, remember those hundreds of millions of topics and time-varying signals in the database. I want to choose the very small number of them that will yield a model that has a signal that looks like my desired signal and have strings that semantically resemble my strings. Okay? So this is a selection task where you want to pick somewhere between 10 and 100 answers, and the set of candidates is the hundreds of millions of, time, of labeled time-varying signals in your social media database. Well, I'm going to propose a scoring model. There's going to be two components. Uh, similarity or semantic scoring and signal scoring. <clears throat> and if I had those two components for every one of my hundreds of millions of topics, then I could have those two components of the score. I could propose some way of combining them. Um, you know, if you had the uh, F1 harmonic mean, then beta in this case would be 1. But you can adjust that to be weighted either closer to the semantic or the signal area, depending on your preference. Okay? But the point here is, if you could compute these two values, like for a given topic, how close in the meaning world, you know, give it a score in the, semantically, the semantic world of your query versus a candidate in that topic database. And then in the signal world, you could have some measure of similarity, say Pearson correlation, between your provided data points and the time varying data points in the database. Okay. So this is at least well defined. I then search and I then sort in descending order on that F sub beta score, and I pick the top K. You now you have your answer. You take those, feed it through your model, and now you have a prediction. Okay. Um, now again, I'll say we enumerate all those K grams, but there's lots of options there. Uh, we use Pearson correlation in this case for signal score, but there's lots of options. And then when it comes to semantic score. Um, Imagine that we take the two strings, the user's query and the label in the database, tokenize them, and then look in a pre-computed thesaurus, um, basically the jacquard overlap of their synonyms in a thesaurus. This is a method that was published previously. Then it gives you roughly a good idea. Um, the time complexity of scoring is order n, of sorting is order n log n, OK? But n is huge, right? n is hundreds of millions here. Um, if you look at how, this, how long this takes on some naive implementations, uh, if you implement that scoring as a UDF in Postgres, it's going to take you more than six hours. Uh, even on Spark, which is kind of the, the go-to system for these large-scale scalable um, data processing tasks, you need to throw quite a lot of cores at this thing before it even comes close to being reasonable. And we imagine there could be potentially several iterations. Yes? Wouldn't you find like a lot of random correlations? Because you're comparing everything. 
think at some point you will find something which is correlated, just by chance. You're absolutely right if you were focusing on one of those dimensions. The, the hypothesis, which has been borne out uh, substantially, uh, is that if you're just searching in the signal domain, you will find a lot of things out there that just happen to be a perfect fit for your unemployment signal, but are not related to unemployment. So if you're predicting the flu, then baking pumpkin muffins is a pretty good one because they both happen in the fall. If you are looking at just the strings, there's going to be a perfect match to your string, but then you're in the friends with benefit case. The hypothesis here is that the number of candidates that match you on both criteria is going to be relatively rare. And after you go through that PCA process, one or two outliers will still, you know, not in the end amount to much in the resulting model. So this kind of two-handed query where you're providing kind of overlapping evidence and hopefully the intersection is a relatively small and high saliency set, that's the core idea of why this would work. So I was more wondering if you would adjust for the numbers of data points you have for the different signals, you can probably also do something. Because the more data points you have, the less likely it is. It's just by chance, right? Um, the less likely, if you have, by data points... Yeah, you, if you look at two correlations, if I look at two signals, like more data points I have and the stronger the correlations, the more certain I can be that they're actually correlated. Yeah. Uh, and would stand the test where like... Yeah. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't adjust explicitly on sort of the size of the data set right now. We mainly treat it as a top K problem, okay. um, which sort of arguably implicitly does that, but eh. we, we can talk about this a little bit. Okay. okay. So now we have what I can call kind of a more formal definition of our computational problem. I have some topic database T. That's what comes out of the social media process. I have a user query, which has both a textual query element and then the signal R, the time varying signal component, a weighting preference, which is basically should I be closer to the semantic or signal side, and I want to find a now casting result, a set of strings as well as, sig as, well as the time varying signal that maximizes that score for all the possible elements in the database. Okay? And I still want to do that as quickly as possible. Well, if you look at what happens in uh, sort of with a naive implementation, the bottleneck is scoring those hundreds of millions of topics for each query. So we're going to throw a, a bunch of different optimizations at this task. Two of them I'll talk about confidence interval pruning in the signal domain, as well as some semantic pruning. Basically, we're going to have a, a lossy uh, pruning method here to get rid of candidates that are obviously wrong. Uh, we also have a lot of low-level optimizations, like throwing SIMD instructions at this thing, but those are a little bit dull. I'm not going to talk about those today. OK, so how can this work? Well. The first take is going to be when we're doing signal process, signal, uh, computing the signal similarity score. For every one of those topics, we're going to create a low resolution version of the signal, which is to say, instead of you know, hundreds of, of points in the hundreds of data points, we'll have some random subsampling of data points. We'll compute a low resolution version of uh, Pearson score. And if we were to throw in a semantic score, more on that in a second, we can compute sort of the combined score with some confidence intervals, which is to say, uh, you know, I know that this is a low resolution signal, so I'm not totally sure what the signal, what the score is, but based on some reasonable you know, statistical assumptions about the data I didn't look at, I can put some confidence interval on it. The more data I use, the more I'll have to bring in from disk, the slower this thing will be, but the tighter those bounds will be. Okay. So we're going to have an iterative process in which when we start out, the number of candidates is huge. It's the entire database. We look at an extremely low resolution version of them. Over time, we're going to eliminate candidates that can't possibly be in the top K as we amp up the resolution. So the number of candidates will shrink over time, but the resolution will grow. And the result will be we're evaluating a smaller and smaller set but shrinking those confidence bounds over time. Okay. okay. On the flip side, on semantic pruning, um, a critical ingredient in computing that semantic score is to, for any given pair of tokens, tell me what the Jacquard score is. So imagine you know, I'm taking two strings, tokenizing it. For every pair of tokens, one from the query, one from the candidate, I can tell you sort of the, the Jacquard-driven semantic score. If I average all of those things, it will tell you the, the overall string score. 
I can build a data structure in which I get not only a query string, but also a threshold, which is to say, I only want to see values that are over a certain threshold. The lower that threshold, the more work there is to do here because the more items are returned. If that threshold is very high, then fewer things come back. As I get more information about my top K list, I can grow that threshold, meaning there's a smaller and smaller space of items that I'm actually interested in the semantic score of. To put this in sort of um, uh, more intuitive terms, a lot of this work is getting rid of the things that are obviously wrong, things that are not correlated at all in the semantic space or in the signal space. When we integrate these, we have alternate rounds of semantic pruning, scoring, signal pruning, and scoring. And I'm constantly figuring out what is the lowest score possible that would admit me to the top K. That forms the set of thresholds I use for the next round of scoring. So I want to show that this thing actually works by having two experimental claims. One is that I can get high quality estimates that this automated system is at least as good as humans and that these runtime optimizations actually work. And we'll do it on a bunch of different phenomena. There's more in the paper, but there's at least uh, six here that I'll talk about. Um, unemployment, I talked about. Uh, flu activity is a well-known one. New York City temperature we chose because we thought it was the dumbest possible thing to use social media for. Like, we've spent a lot of work festooning the whole world with really good temperature sensors. Why would you ever ask Twitter, like, with a temperature in New York? Well, it turns out people talk about the weather all the time. And actually, if you're somehow locked in a room where you have access to Twitter, but not the weather app, you can get a very good idea what the weather is. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, I think I want the opposite of that room. Um, OK, so, so let's look at the quality side. So there's six plots here, one for each of our topics. On the x-axis, I have, I'm ra rating semantic relevance. That is to say, how close was I in the set of texts, or instead of the relationship of the topic to my query string. On the y-axis, I have signal correlation. How close was the output signal to my supervision? In this case, I know the true answer. So computing signal correlation is easy. For semantic relevance, I'm going to ship these strings to a bunch of crowd workers and have them annotate does X imply, or does, do X and Y mean the same thing? And they can say yes or no. Okay? The average of many of those workers is what's indicated on the X axis. The best thing to be is to the upper right, right? A, a now casting result which is extremely close to the signal domain and topically very related to your string. In all of these, the red dots here are raccoon DB for different settings of that beta parameter. So you might emphasize being on the signal side, you might emphasize being on the semantic side. But the point is, you want to be on the outer upper right envelope of this. The blue line is when we gave human workers 15 minutes to craft these signals by hand. So we asked them, like, sit in this machine, you can type in whatever string you want. Um, we will show you the results. You have to come up with the strings, and then after we show you the results, you can choose to accept it or not for the, the model that we will generate at the end of 15 minutes. Okay, so they're essentially the economists. That's the same process we went through with the economists, just you know, 15 minutes instead of months. Um, in all these cases, raccoon DB from the quality domain is you're dominating the human beings. When it comes time to run, when it comes to runtime, we're going to compare you again all of these different targets. You can see on the, each row is for a different target, and you can see the runtime for um, Postgres and then Spark on 30 cores or Spark on 300 cores. You can see that when you apply all of our optimizations, Postgres runs in over six hours as opposed to 3.6 seconds. On 30 cores, um, you know, we, we can Spark runs in a little bit more than 1,100 seconds. We're at 1 1.2 seconds. And even if you give Spark a 270 core advantage, uh, we're still 123 times faster. OK, they're a general purpose system. We aren't. But the point is that there's quite a lot of information you can exploit here. Um, I'm going to skip some of the conclusions here uh, or the last comments because I think I've gone over it substantially. At this point, 
Uh, I think we only have about five minutes. Is that right? Yeah, five minutes. Okay. I'm going to talk very, very quickly about one additional uh, piece of work, which is applying data science and, again, some economics to a kind of uh, disturbing but important problem, which is human trafficking. Um, this is a little bit more, there's nothing graphic in these slides, but it's a little more disturbing than the typical computer science talk, so, you know, take a care. Um, <clears throat> you know, human trafficking is a, at this point, a fairly well-known crime that <clears throat> obtains labor via either financial or physical coercion. And in the West, um, it's believed that many trafficked individuals are channeled into sex work. Uh, other possibilities are agricultural labor or, labor or factory work. Uh, it turns out that there's not a lot of data on those sets online, but sex workers, like many other forms of commerce, have gone online in recent years. So we have quite a lot of advertising and quite a lot of data about how they operate. The traditional problem in attacking this from a law enforcement perspective has been that there are a very large number of sex workers who are not, in fact, trafficked individuals, that they are more willingly engaging in that work. <coughs> Law enforcement cannot easily distinguish those two cases. And so <clears throat> if you were to prior try to prioritize sex trafficked or finding trafficked individuals, it's not clear how you would do it. So um, you know, it is possible to go to a number of websites. Some of these are still in business. Others have been shut down um, by the authorities um, and these advertisements resemble kind of um, Craigslist ads, which is to say they're text. They're often extremely informal in language. They use a lot of slang. But they tend to contain the same kind of information again and again, like contact info, personal details, price, and so on. And looking at these ads is really unfun. I don't recommend it. But from an analytical and intelligence point of view, it's potentially a goldmine. Um, okay, so here's a, a sample ad. This is not a very graphic one at all. Um, you know, this says someone who claims their name. Um, they have a claimed age. They'll have some contact details. They say here, out calls only, which means the uh, provider travels to the john rather than vice versa. So what we'd like to do is to produce some kind of predictive model that can analyze all of these ads and tell us who's a trafficked individual and, not, and who's not. Now, I got into this work from a purely technical perspective, which is to say you want to take these raw text ads and perform some information extraction on them. That is, build a database in which a row in the database contains facts that are faithful to the factual claims made in the source text. Okay? If you had that database, now you're in a pure kind of data science Scenario: Ship this database to your favorite data scientists, and they can build you a predictive model. Okay. So we wanted to attack that from a technical perspective. We also want to build user-facing tools. We've made some progress on that. And then you can build a lot of analytical tools and make substantive social science findings. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, cut to the chase. I should identify one, one thing first. It may seem impossible. How can you actually do this. I mean, the text for one worker looks like the text for another. Um, there's a handful of features that we've found from using uh, supervised data provided by law enforcement about which features you know, indicate someone's more at risk for being a trafficking victim. Two of the best, or some of the best are, is the price being requested substantially lower than you would expect in that geographic area. Like low pricing because the provider is not in control of their own pricing really seems to be a very strong signal. Uh, another is, does the person post the same advertisement from multiple geographic locations in rapid succession, suggesting that perhaps they're being moved from place to place? These are things that you know, law enforcement could suggest to you, or maybe your own uh, kind of creative thinking could suggest to you are potential uh, you know, warning signs, but you wouldn't know until you built the model, and, and we, can, we can bear this out. OK. Um, I'll mention this is possible through an awful lot of collaborators, uh, including my uh, frequent collaborators, Chris Ray at Stanford and Greg D'Angelo at Claremont, but a, a cast of many to get this thing done. Let me talk about the substantive findings of this thing. You can build a web-facing tool. This is not a fun web-facing tool, but it's useful for law enforcement. Um, 
Let me talk about some of the, the novel social science that this computer science angle enables. So you know, I got into this, from, again, from a computer science point of view, solving that technical problem of information extraction. But once you have this, what's a novel finding that you could do? Well, let's imagine that you, know, you build this predictor. And for any advertisement, you now have a machine that can tell you, you know, with some amount of accuracy, is this person trafficked or not? Okay. Um, if you combine that with a data feed, your new advertisements that are coming in, you can now use that predictor or that model to tell you like, how many new people are showing up in the data feed and how many people were advertising but are no longer showing up in the, data, in the incoming stream of advertisements. And at the same time, you can combine that with something in economics called the Bardic Wage Instrument. This is basically a, a sort of an analytical data set that measures the relative male or female economic opportunity in a given geographic area compared to the country overall. So, for example, if a hospital opens in a given area uh, which employs a uh, outsized number of females, then that number for females opportunity would go up. If the oil derrick closes down, which employs an outsized number of males, then the male number goes down. So one question you could ask is, if I now have good data about the rate of people coming in and out of the trafficking world, how does that relate to an economic understanding of gendered economic opportunity in a given area? Well, here's some, some social findings, Sutton's findings you can get out of it. One is that the rate of new advertisements does not seem correlated with either kind of opportunity. We think this is because, you know, I should say, well, I'll describe the finding and then our plausible explanation, but of course we don't know why that is, right? We have correlations and not, not explanations of these things. Um, it's largely believed that trafficking is an opportunistic crime. It's hard to substantially amp up or go down your efforts to be a trafficker. So it could be that even if there is a change in the local economy, the number of new trafficking victims just doesn't change that much. However, exit is a different story. Um, improved female opportunity is correlated with increased exit from the trafficking world. I mean, we see more trafficking individuals leave the data stream. Um, this could be because they actually have different you know, economic resources, a better ability to resist. The reverse is true with increased male opportunity. Increased male opportunity decreases the exit rate of trafficking victims, um, possibly because the traffickers, they're already committing the crime, but they now have a greater economic incentive to keep people there. Okay. There's quite a lot of, excuse me, there's quite a lot of related work in this area, uh, both on the social science and technical side. Um, let me summarize by just saying this. You know, the, the general field of combining computer science and, in my case, economics, but social science more broadly, it just seems absolutely terrific to me. There's, there's a huge amount of opportunity both to have real impact on you know, people who really need help or alternatively on you know, the largest machine around, which is the overall economy. Like the, it, it really dwarfs you know, shipping a bunch of downloads in most cases. Uh, it's really exciting. Um, and it's also interesting in that it, it will, you know, it involves collaborating with people that most of the world has not d done before, but maybe at Chicago is kind of a uniquely uh, possible and strong here. So all this is to say that I think uh, you, this work as well as the speaker series is a very exciting kind of development. Um, there's an awful lot of work that I think you know, either we're doing or could be done that I haven't been able to talk about today, but maybe we'll talk a little bit about it one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions, and I will bring you the mic. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about the PCA. Do you allow for any pre-processing before you do all the scoring? Just because in terms of topics might not be really, the, the items that you include might not be really correlated to each other if you, if you don't have we, any pre We do some amount of normalization of the tweets, which is okay. to say we, um, you know, we transform numbers into a generic num token. Mm -hmm. um, we tra we uh, transform URLs into a generic URL token. Mm -hmm. Messages that are, um, oh, and then we, we go to some amount of work to make sure that language and geography are the area of interest that we want to explore. Um, you can see over the course of our sample that the, 
the tweet stream is changing quite a lot. Usage of Twitter changes, uh, and especially the set of people who are using it in terms of what geography in the world uh, changes. We hopefully strip out a lot of those issues so that the sample that we generate or the, the stats that we generate are consistent across the time set. And my follow-up question to that is, with reliability analysis and generalizability from a social science perspective, uh, from anything published in manuscript-wise, are you generalizing it to, to the people in the Twitter um, area or generalizable to, you know, like the United States if you're, if you're looking at human trafficking and things of that nature? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit unclear so what, on the question. So, like, in terms of if, for publishing this work going yeah. forward in using the database, the one thing that we always have a problem in the medical field is what is our denominator? Is our denominator, like, the hospital patients or the, oh, the people in the community area? Yeah, um, we have to go to some lengths to try to figure out, in the, in the Twitter case, how many actual human beings are behind it. Um, we do that... Because, you know, for example, like if Twitter were to you know, re deploy a new spam detector, um, then maybe the number of humans is the same, but it appears to us there's dramatically fewer tweets. Um, we, go to, we don't know the true number of people using it, and we don't, don't know which of those are bots and which ones aren't. So we have to come up with sort of a synthetic time-changing denominator, which we uh, build by asking have a host of questions we think only human beings are going to say to each other, like happy birthday or happy anniversary, things like that. Um, if you're writing a bunch of Twitter bots, don't say those words because it's going to screw up the, the, the system. But you know, we, we try to do something like that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. I, I actually had a question about uh, the Raccoon DB. You, yeah. You had uh, shown that beta right, changes depending um, and that you can get very good results, but my question is, do you see domain-specific optimal betas, and do you think that there's anything behind that if, the, if it does exist? And then the, the follow-up would be, do you think that there's a way that this could be used to show linguistic drift? So, for example, it could be that the, uh, uh, you know, the patterns and the semantic meaning about weather are quite stable, but they would not be stable for, say, unemployment. It, have yeah. you looked into that? Um, to answer the first question, you know, the choice of beta is substantially a kind of user policy question. In some cases, it may be that uh, you have a phenomenon where you don't believe your data set. Uh, you're, you're, you know that your data is weak or like you have reason to suspect it. So for that, you may just decide, um, I'm going to trust the betas that uh, you know, weigh one side of the equation more than the other. Probably best practice is to always compute the range and then, you know, see which one you, you believe at the end of the day. Um, I'm sorry, remind me the, the second question was? Oh, the second question is that there should, you believe that there should be some stability potentially in the beta that should be used oh, to oh. say a domain specific thing that doesn't change much like the weather versus unemployment where you might see different patterns associated even though the semantic meaning is the same. Yeah, um, if we see changing language use, you know, let's say a new way of indicating job loss that we didn't see before, um, if that, you know, the way that we would identify extremely surprising slang, let's say, relies really on that thesaurus-based mechanism. If there's some no totally novel way of expressing it that's not captured in our thesaurus, then it simply won't appear to us. Uh, it will seem to us as if the signal were highly correlated, at least for a period of time, but that semantically it was unrelated and as a result would be scored relatively lowly. And so if you, have, if you have changing language use, but all of it can be detected, then there's reason to think that we'll find all of it. It will actually be found to have the same factor in that PCA process. So I think we'd be robust to that. If you have entirely novel expressions, and we didn't see that much in unemployment, but if you look at the human trafficking data, the slang is ridiculous and it's novel quite frequently. Um, then it would rely entirely on the quality of our thesaurus. We don't have a complicated statistical mechanism for figuring out synonyms, although those exist in other pieces of research. Time for one more question. Uh, 
I wanted to ask, what is the uh, process of kind of extracting the, that information you're putting into your database from the websites? Um, I'm assuming it's automated, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that process. You mean in the, in the advertisement collection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the... Um, it's, a, it's a web crawler that gets the raw texts. Then we send it through kind of a, a standard uh, HTML scrubbing process. So we try to identify... Uh, you know, eliminate the boilerplate website-specific code and so on. Then there's an extraction mechanism where we try to construct that high-quality structured representation of the raw text. Um, that's you know, a, a long technical discussion that uh, is sort of outside the scope of this. But you can imagine, um, let's say you're trying to extract uh, a place name while you're figuring out... Um, is the person saying that they offer service in a given location. Um, there's an initial phase of your candidate generation where you might say, for this document, I'm going to enumerate all the things that I think are even remotely uh, place names, you, either things that occur in my place name dictionary or alternatively don't match my common noun dictionary. Then we compute have a, a very large number of natural language style statistics uh, and build a classifier model internally. And so that... that Candidate generation and training procedure takes place for every column of the database that you want to construct. All right, well, that was a great talk, and uh, let's all thank Michael uh, one more time for thank you. coming to see.